good evening to everyone. It's 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 I'm delighted to be here tonight for your, for your evening and, and for the Asia Society of Australia. So many beautiful people out there in the audience and lots of suits with ties and <laughs> all the colours up the front here. Um, before I begin, I'd uh, I'd like to um, acknowledge. Uh, my ancestors from this land, um, my elders, past, present and emerging, all the kids that do such an amazing job at, at our land council, at our headquarters down at, um, down at the Abbasid Convent, if you're ever down that way, pop in and say hello, and acknowledge the wider Aboriginal community here in Melbourne. Um, also acknowledge um, any elders in, in the audience or, or anyone who's... Where's the cameras up there? Right on me. Focus right on me. Hello. Anyone who's online, um, acknowledge all the elders there online as well and international and interstate um, viewers here tonight. The Melbourne Asia Game Changer. This country has a long association with the Asian community. Um, you know, I've got some very dear Vietnamese friends and Chinese friends and, and Cambodian friends and Japanese friends. And I s we had a conversation one night. I said to them, us blackfellas, we, we, we live in Australasia as well. You know what I mean? And, and and we sort of, we discussed it that night and said, you know, you are part of us as well. We're, we're part of this, this region of the world that that's, you know, even though we might not know it, we've had close ties and, and close relationships with, with, with our neighbours in, in this region of the world for thousands and thousands of years you know we're all we're very cultural people i think that's what separates us fr from a lot of the rest of the world is that we're very deep into our culture and and, and into our own <coughs> ancient stories and and our spirituality and, and our religions and, and um you know, and, and I really value that as, as, as an Aboriginal person here in this country that's, you know, dealt with, you know, quite significant trauma and, 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 and disadvantage and, and, and separated and, and, and never felt part of growing up and, and going to school because... I look different to everyone else, or, or you know, um, I just didn't measure up enough, and, and that hurts you deeply, you know, t as a child, until you can learn to manage all that stuff, and, and, and because you know, my life has always been my culture, my family, <laughs> my elders. And, and and you know who I wanted to be growing up as well, and, and, and I never had the same opportunity opportunities as a lots of my you know um, white skinned Australians that that I attended school with, and, and I was targeted by the police a lot because of the colour of my skin, you know. And so you know. <laughs> I come from out the southeastern suburbs. I was born in 1964 when the Beatles came to Melbourne, and that's why I got that name, Uncle well, Ringo. <laughs> and everyone knows me as Uncle Ringo. My real name's where's Veronica? She's here. There she is, Ronnie. So I told Ronnie, um, my name's actually Ronald, so I'm Ronnie too, but <laughs> with an I. 
I also said two wrongs don't make a right, but <laughs> <laughs> on your Ronnie. But um you know <laughs> our friends from, you know, Asia, Southeast Asia, China, all those countries, um, Philippines, you know, Malaysia, all those beautiful countries have made significant contributions to our community here. India, you know, um, my favourite food is Vietnamese food and Indian food, Chinese, and then all the rest after that. But <laughs> kangaroo. <laughs> um, sorry, mate. But, um, <laughs> what's that, Skip? You want me to follow you? No, it's all right. My favourite show was Skippy, but... Yeah, going back, to, I, I grew up in Dandenong, um, and also I grew up down in Far East Gippsland on the on the mission stations, Lake Tyres, and my connection to country here is through my father, but my mother's people, both my parents are Aboriginal, and my mother's people come from Far East Gippsland around Lake Centrance area and Bairnsdale, all the way to the New South Wales border. But <laughs> we... So I was born in Warrigal, 1964, when the Beatles came to town. Um, we moved up to Dandenong in the, in the late 60s. And, and my father worked for APM Timber Mills most of his life and seasonal work and stuff like that. <laughs> it was then that I, that I noticed, you know, a, a very strong... Vietnamese presence in our community out there in the southeast. Um, you know, lot, lots of refugees from from that that horrible war in Vietnam. You know, um, luckily enough, arrived on our shores and and, and you know um, escaped. Um, you know, um, Ho Chi Minh and, and and his government at the time. If, if you you served with the South Vietnamese, then you were going to be targeters, targets of, of the North Vietnamese army and and, and their their henchmen, much like you know, um, unfortunately, people in, in Afghanistan right at the present moment. You know, since um, American forces again, you know, evacuated the country and and. and um, left the vacuum and, 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 you know, you know, Cambodia, <coughs> you know, um, yeah, I was going to talk about, you know, the genocide and, 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 and the colonisation of this country, but um, I don't have to, you know, because our neighbours endured, you know, the days of Pol Pot and, and the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia and another big influx of, of, of refugees escaping, <coughs> you know, war zones and people walking around with automatic weapons and, and, and killing kids and it'll never escape me, that image of that young Vietnamese girl running across a rice paddies, absolutely naked and, 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 you know, on a brighter note, <coughs> um, I think the world really stood up. One of my heroes in this country was um, Dr. Victor Chang. That um, you know performed a life-saving heart transplant operation on a young Australian girl called Fiona Coote. She was only 14 years old at the time, and, and although you know um, her body rejected that first heart transplant, she undertook another one two years later, and she, she's still alive today. She's actually 51 years of age now. And, but, you know... <coughs> and then, you know, um, reading some years later that he'd been um, assassinated, you know, and, and murdered, and, and that absolutely broke my heart. Um, I think it broke a lot of hearts in this country when we lost, <coughs> you 
you know, s such a man, and, and, and you know, it's just one example of, of of a real game changer, you know, and that's what we're here tonight to. That's why you're all gathered here tonight. I've got to duck off soon, but um, <laughs> at the back door through a little escape hatch. Um, but you know, it's it's just one of the examples right out here as well. This is my favourite part of Melbourne. This this top end of Swanston Street. You know, lots of the students come up and. There's lots of, you know, lots of food available along this, along this precinct and, and your contribution to this country is, is, is can't be measured, you know, and, and it still continues today and, and I say that with a lot of love and respect. <coughs> um, my family doctor is, is, is Dr Ben Chan and out there Dan in all and um my all time hero was was the great Bruce Lee, you know, so I love you. I just love you fellas. <laughs> God what can I say? You know? Um we all come from very you know, oldest living cultures in the world that I know of and, and, and rich cultures and, and very family orientated and spiritual and it's just a beautiful thing to be part of, you know? So, um, <coughs> on behalf of, well, my connection here to Melbourne is, is to probably the most notable um, elder that we know of, Grandfather William Barrick, um, so my connection to grandfather is he is my great 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 grandmother's older brother. So I come straight from the royal family in Melbourne. <laughs> so through that um, beautiful connection, I just want to <coughs> extend a, a very warm and sincere welcome to everyone here tonight and everyone online. And I'll leave you with a quote from the great master himself teacher. Life itself is your teacher and you are in a state of constant learning. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle Ringo, for your welcome to country. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Philip Ivanov. I'm the CEO of Asia Society Australia. Welcome to Asia Society and welcome to the Wheeler Centre for the inaugural Melbourne Asia Game Changer Awards. So many participants in today's event are joining us in person, uh, but also dialing in from locations that have traditional honours and custodians. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge these honours and pay my respect to their eldest past, present, and emerging. I would also like to welcome and acknowledge any Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander, or First Nations people joining our webcast, as well as our event in person today. First, um, let me thank a few people who made this evening possible. Selection Committee for the Melbourne Asia Game Changer Awards, um, Lynn Ahn, Director of Souvenirs of Sleep, Alice Wan, our Board Director of Asia Society Australia, Ganul Serbes, CEO of Global Victoria, Andrew Ware, um, City Economist and Director of Economic Development from the City of Melbourne, and of course, Carol Llewellyn, CEO of the Wheeler Centre and our host. Thank you so much for helping us make this event possible. Um, I also would like to acknowledge the founding partner of Asia Society in Australia, Victorian government represented here by Rob Holland, executive director at the Department of Premier and Cabinet. And of course, big welcome and big thank you to members of Asia Society. Thank you for backing us, especially in those last very difficult two years. So good to see so many friends, uh, so many familiar faces in the audience and online. This is our first face-to-face -face gathering since April. 
So it's very fitting that we meet today uh, to celebrate leadership, inclusion, connection with the region and the world. We also celebrate Melbourne today um, and its spirit of openness, multiculturalism and a myriad of links that connect Melbourne uh, or making Melbourne one of Asia and this region's most exciting cities. So what we saw in a couple of days in Parliament House is not the Melbourne that we love. Tonight is a much better representation of what Melbourne is. The Asia Game Changer Awards launched by Asia Society in New York in 2014 are designed to fill a vital gap identifying and honouring true leaders who are making a positive contribution to the future of our region. These awards recognise individuals, organisations and also movements that have inspired and shown true leadership in areas that reflect Asia society's core pillars of business policy, education and the arts. Previous game changers from our centres in the US and Asia include tennis star Naomi Osaka, actor Dev Patel, film director Johnny Mo, cellist Yo-Yo Ma and worldwide pop sensation BTS. So tonight we're launching Asia Game Changers in Australia. Our aim is to showcase under-recognized and inspirational Australians, whatever their cultural or professional background is, who are making positive contribution to the region and Australia's future in Asia, in their communities but also in their field. This program is a part of the narrative close to our heart that Australia is not an odd man in Asia, but a big active part of this fantastic region and therefore our actions both at home and abroad should reflect it. That is why our strategy for the next five years is called Navigating Shared Futures. And as we embarked on bringing Asia Game Changes, Changes series to Australia, it was an easy choice to make Melbourne the home of the awards. Melbourne's multicultural heart, its weight in education and in arts and its entrepreneurial spirit makes it a fitting home for Asia Game Changers in Australia. And our ambition for the program is to make it a long-standing national celebration of Australian contribution to the region. After a three months nomination process, we were heartened by the strong response from our national network and many inspiring stories of Asia Australia ambassadors across Australia and the region. So congratulations to Daisy, Lee, and Leah, our inaugural Game Changers today. Like you, I'm looking forward to hearing. <laughs> hearing your stories later this evening. Um, before I pass it on to our host, it's my great pleasure to read a very touching message from Victorian Premier Dan Andrews, who's sending his apologies for not being able to join us tonight. Um, I think it's a very touching a letter, and I want to read it in full if you don't mind. He says, Victoria isn't just proud of its diversity. We know it's one of our strengths because the people who come from abroad to make Victoria their home bring new perspectives and enhance the way we grow as a community and as a state. That's why the Asia Game Changer Awards are so important. They celebrate those who believe in a better, more inclusive future and work tirelessly every day to achieve it. The bond between Australia and Asia is one that Victoria has embraced for decades. It endures through the families in our communities and the shared goals our government pursues with every nation in the region. I want to acknowledge the nominees for this year's Asia Game Changer Awards and thank you for your ongoing commitment to strengthening Asia-Australia relationship. And on behalf of the Victorian government, I send my deepest Congratulations to Daisy, Lee, and Leah for winning these prestigious awards. So that's the Premier, um, but with the Russian accent. Um, and on housekeeping, um, just before I pass it on uh, to our uh, game changers, it's great to have a room full of in-person attendees for the first time in a long time. We're also very proud of a couple of hundred people that dial in and watching it from the comfort of their home. So our proceedings this evening will run until 7.45 and featuring a special message from Melbourne's Lord Mayor, as well as our game changers in conversation with our host this evening. And we could not have asked 
for a better host of the first Melbourne Asia Game Changers. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Melissa Leung, Australian television host, food writer, broadcaster, critic and editor. She is the first female and Asian Australian host of MasterChef Australia. You would have seen her on television shows, Everyday Gourmet, The Cook's Pantry and The Chef's Line, as well as read many of her books and commentary on food and travel, and we hear fashion as well. Born to Singaporean parents who migrated to Australia in the 1970s, Melissa is a game changer in her own right. So we're thrilled to have her as our host and MC for this evening. Over to you. Wow. Thank you so much to the Asia Society Australia for having me. It's a true honour to be standing amongst people with the shared sentiment and vision for an inclusive and successful future together. Now, may I say this is a slightly weird moment for me because as you know, in Asian culture, we don't usually get up in front of each other and talk about our achievements. That's usually what the top of the piano at our parents' house is for. So anyway, nevertheless, I'm extremely happy to be here and I think that nights like tonight are important for our community in owning our contributions to the world around us. When I stepped into this role as the first Asian and female judge on MasterChef Australia, um, I didn't really think too much about the broader implications of what it would, what it would mean in my being here how it would resonate with fans of the show, as well as women and Asian communities, both here and overseas. It sounds silly in hindsight, but as a freelance journalist and a marketer for the past decade and a half prior to me taking the job, um, I wasn't really thinking about the macro implications of my choices at the time. My version of growing up in Australia sounds a lot like a lot of other migrant families. My Chinese parents arrived in, from Singapore in the 70s, hoping to give their future family greater opportunities and experiences outside of the tiny island that they grew up on. When my brother and I came along a few years later, we were part of a small community of their friends from Hong Kong and from Singapore. But from the outset, I always felt as if we had two lives. The Australian one that we had at school and after school activities, except maybe Kumon, and the Asian one that we had at home that involved discipline, commitment to academics, and food that few of my friends at school would understand. I didn't know it then, but my inherited Singaporean obsession with food would become the foundation of the career that I'm so proud of today. Back then, while I did pride myself on being that kid with the weird lunches sometimes, I think, like all kids, we just wanted to fit in. The ability to code switch uh, between uh, being more Australian in some rooms and being more Asian at home is a skill that many of us have honed in order to find um, a harmonious way to live. And it's definitely something that I consider a lot these days. Looking back, I can see two themes uh, that I've made, uh, that have really made me who I am today. And both of them stem from the tension between these two cultural experiences. The first is the desire to be understood. And the second is the determination to defy expectations and stereotypes. When straddling worlds, we develop ways to cope. And that code switching I referred to earlier is just a fancy way of explaining how we modulate the way that we speak, the way that we carry ourselves in order to be accepted and understood. I never actually thought I would become a writer or a communicator, but even now I believe that the reason why I did was that early on I swore to myself that on every medium I could muster, I would learn to be an effective communicator. Clearly I'm still learning to be a public speaker, so thank you so much for your kindness and generosity this evening. Now, the desire to defy has been with me since birth, though. I've always enjoyed the look of shock on people's faces when I could do something that they didn't expect that I could do. Kids that looked like me growing up uh, weren't expected to do things like nippers or rock climbing. You know, we did things like piano and violin and went to study groups and compare grades. Um, and, OK, so I did all of those things too, but it's really good to cover your bases, right? <laughs> The overachieving Asian stereotype is one that we all smirk at a little bit as adults, but in all honesty, I am so proud to have had the opportunities to find out what I was good at, juggle lots of activities, and to learn how to succeed when stress is applied. Over the years, while I might not have known it, these themes have led me down a path that I've made all on my own. 
It might have been easier and less stress on my folks to follow a slightly more traditional path, but thankfully my brother is just about to graduate as a doctor, so I'm pretty happy to be the rogue Asian in my family. <laughs> Being part of the food media industry over so many years has given me a privileged insight into such a vibrant and vital part of our Australian culture. Dining out is a joy that many of us share, and here in Melbourne, we're so fortunate to have such a diverse and exciting dining scene. And I know we're all looking forward to diving back into that now that we finally can. Chefs like Khan Nguyen of Aru and Sunda, Nabil Ansari, and of course, Roisin Kaul over at Etta, are part of the next generation of super talented Asian chefs in this city. And they share a knack for interpreting cuisines of the region, integrating Indigenous Australian ingredients, and infusing modern touches and global techniques in a way that makes what they do feel utterly fresh and entirely original. Seeing the impact that the last two years of COVID has had on the industry up close has been super heartbreaking, but it's also been really inspiring. People in hospitality are some of the most hardworking, resilient and creative people I know. So as the city opens, I invite all diners to be patient and kind at this time while everybody gets back on their feet. I always describe my career as being quite piecemeal. When people ask, how did I get here? Uh, I'm very mindful to express gratitude to the few but vital people that opened doors to me and believed that I could. Other doors remained shut, kept by people who didn't believe that I deserved to occupy space in such a highly competitive environment, which is why I chose to freelance. And I can say that uh, going my own way has made all the difference in me finding my own place in the world. True story, I never actually sought to do television at all, but I continued to be encouraged to kind of look into it. And when seeking advice, um, I was once told by a television executive producer that I shouldn't try television because I'd never make it. Uh, he said he didn't say it to be mean. He just knew that historically, most people who look like me don't get much further than SBS in this country. But we're changing that. And it is with great pride that I stand here today, defiant in that advice. I'm so glad that I listened to my gut and kept going. Thank you. I think the crucial part is to open yourself up to opportunities and the support that you do receive and let go of the people that just don't see you. Ultimately, I believe that if you are open, you will find your place, your tribe, your purpose, but you need to keep going. I was once asked in an interview on breaking the bamboo ceiling what my advice was for getting ahead. And I said, pick and choose your battles wisely. You can't win them all, but we need to be in the room and part of the conversation if we are going to be able to change it. Because if not us, then who? So to you, wherever you may be in your career or realising your dreams, I hope that you are able to know the power of your own identity, the value of appreciating where you come from and realising that you are not alone. Growing up, I didn't see a whole lot of people being celebrated in Australia that looked like me. So while I didn't realise the significance of saying yes to MasterChef initially, hearing from so many people that it means something to them has brought it all on home. As they say, if you can see it, then you can be it. So by celebrating the achievements of Asian, Australia's, Asian Australians and giving each other the visibility and the voice, together we get to change the narrative. Thank you. Not quite done yet, um, but I'd love to now pass on to you a message from the Lord Mayor of Melbourne, Sally Cap. Any second now. She's coming. Hello everyone, I'm Lord Mayor Sally Cap. I, uh, on behalf of the City of Melbourne, I respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I'm speaking to you from tonight, the Wurundjeri Wurrung people, and I pay our respects to their elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge some special guests that we have with us this evening, Philip Ivanov, CEO of Asia Society Australia, Caro Llewellyn, CEO of the Wheeler Centre, all of the selection committee and nominees, and Melissa Leong, Master Chef host and judge, and your Game Changers Awards host. Welcome to Marvellous Melbourne. 
we are thrilled to welcome the Melbourne Asia Game Changer Awards to our city. There has never been a better time to immerse yourself in our central business district, which is also an outstanding central experience district. From our prestigious shops to our world-class dining and arts precincts, we have invested big to reignite the city and our treasured way of life here in Melbourne and to bring people back together. I encourage you all to get out there and explore everything on offer. As Lord Mayor, I'm very proud of this city and the people of this city. Over the past two years, our community has shown remarkable resilience, ingenuity and compassion. It is because of these strengths that we are coming back bigger and better than ever before. I'm excited to be part of this event this evening because you represent so many of the attributes I admire. Innovation, creativity, exploration, leadership, they're all exhibited in Game Changers. They are, you are, the everyday heroes that go beyond to serve our community, especially during the hardships experienced throughout the pandemic period. In a time when it was easy to feel disconnected, you have forged ahead to ensure that our connections with Asia remain robust. A special congratulations, of course, to our inaugural Melbourne Asia Game Changers, Daisy Mann, Lee Tran Beijing. and Lee McIntosh. Thank you for enriching our relationship with Asia and for your contributions to our education, our arts and entrepreneurship sectors. The City of Melbourne has always had a rich multicultural history. It's one of our strengths here uh, for both our community and our economy. Melbourne holds close ties with Asia through our city to city connections and our sister city partnerships, including Osaka in Japan and Tianjin in China. These relationships have inspired many great achievements already in innovation, education, business and trade over the past decade. While COVID-19 has altered many rhythms, I'm thankful, thankful for our ongoing collaboration with Asia. Asia is one of the most evolved and competitive global economies, and Melbourne and Victoria will be reliant on strong and constructive engagement with Asia as we look to recover from the impacts of COVID-19 together. My sincere congratulations to the Asia Society for all the work that you do. We're thrilled to partner with you on this wonderful initiative and we look forward to many more Game Changers stories of success. Thank you for showcasing our city and its people and for spreading the message far and wide, Melbourne is open for business. Thank you. Okay, now on to the focus of celebration this evening. I am thrilled to announce the Asian Australian Game Changers. After a three month national nomination campaign, please join me in greeting our three inaugural Game Changers. First up, Daisy Mann is the founder of the Australian Digital Job Accelerator and co-founder of Australian South Asian Centre. She is passionate about young people and shaping the future social entrepreneurship and representation. The Australian Digital Job Accelerator is an inspiring project aimed at increasing women's confidence and ability to generate income through freelancing, which I know all about. <laughs> In addition to her many accolades, Daisy is also building a social movement to empower South Asian women through Bol Punja and the, Asian, so the Australian South Asian Centre. Please welcome Daisy Mann. Lee Tran is a, professor, is a professor at the School of Education at Deakin University and is the Australian Research Council Future Fellow. Lee has conducted groundbreaking research on reciprocal student mobilities between Asia and Australia and provided policy advice and commentary on international education. She is an inspiring voice advocating for international students in Australia. Her research and commentaries help inform policies, enrich public understanding, understandings about international students' socio-cultural, educational, diplomatic and economic contributions to Australia. Please welcome Lee Tran. <laughs> and 
And finally, Leah Jing McIntosh is the founding editor of Liminal. Since 2017, Leah has published art, writing and interviews by and for Asian Australian artists. She has founded National Literary Prizes for Minoritized Writers, co-edited Collisions, a critically acclaimed collection of fiction by First Nations writers and writers of colour. For her work on Liminal, she has been named a Victorian nominee for Young Australian of the Year, one of Forbes, Asia, Forbes Asia's 30 under 30 and recognises one of Asia Link's 40 under 40 most influential Asian Australians. No big deal, really. Please welcome Leah. <laughs> This is the bit where we sort of get to be comfy. My pants are a little tight, so please excuse me for looking uncomfortable. Okay, so let's start off with you, Daisy. You know, what does the Australian Digital Job Accelerator serve and why did you start it during the pandemic? Sure. Well, you know, as a freelancer, <laughs> some of the struggles around freelancing. <laughs> so actually, during the pandemic, like, digital work was booming. But mm. when I, I put up a project, I was trying to get a podcast produced, so I have a few podcasts, and I it, it's in Punjab. Derby. I won't mention it because it's a bit of a comedy podcast um, and I was looking for someone who speaks Punjabi and I thought there's so many people out there people are going to bid for this and I kept upping the hourly rate I kept upping it to late and I was looking for someone quite junior and I just couldn't find anyone in because um, I was looking specifically for someone in India or Australia who's South Asian mm -hmm. and no one would bid it for the job and I thought I wonder what's gone wrong here and I ended up hiring someone here who was ex sort of radio producer and then as I started doing more research I realized um, a lot of South Asian women are completely missing from the freelancing space on, mm -hmm. on sites like Upwork, Freelancer.com. Yet during lockdown, so many people have lost their jobs and digital work is the way to go. But there was this huge lag. So I thought, why don't we? And then when I talked to, we interviewed a bunch of women in India and Australia and said, why aren't you freelancing? There was these different assumptions that you have to be an expert before you even start. Um, so everybody was looking for a job, but nobody was understanding that, hey, you're going to have to create your own path post COVID. Yeah. And that's sort of where it started with me posting my own kind of task up there. Yeah. But at the same time, I was always looking at ways to create employment opportunities for South Asian women that help them with economic independence. Amazing. And how has it, has, how has it tracked? It's been great. So we just finished teaching the last round. So the first round we had about 40 women take part over about 200 and something applications. Mm. Um, and that was half of the women were from India and half were from Australia, all South Asian. Uh, and we had about, I think, a 30% increase on monthly income for all the women who attended the entire course. Mm. So we're really, really focused on sales and marketing, helping them bid for jobs and boost their confidence. Mm. Um, most of them have the technical skills. I don't need to teach them how to write. They're better writers than I am. Um, <laughs> It's more about landing gigs. Yeah. And so they sell themselves short, they don't pitch for gigs, and it's because they're sort of waiting for someone to come to them to offer them something, or they're applying for traditional work. It's that funny mm. adage about, you know, sort of um, men will apply for a job that they're not fully qualified for, but unless women are fully qualified for the job, we won't apply. So it's yeah. interesting just sort of giving people a bit of a shot in the arm in terms of confidence yeah. to say, look, I have... A, you know, a huge skill set here and I can actually contribute something. So, exactly. yeah, yeah, giving exactly. them the platform. I mean, our amazing. programs at the moment, it's only open to women, yet yeah. we still get men applying every yeah. year. And it says <laughs> women, but I've never seen a woman apply for a men's program, ever. Well, well, it's, like it's, comp and then I've even seen people say, oh, why not? I want a job. Well, it's that thing because, like, it still says men in there that they don't see the... Any anyway, yeah. moving on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, Lee, you know, tell me about why you decided to enter the field of international education specifically and what is it about it that lights you up? Yeah, sure. Um, so my personal and educational background has had an impact on my um, motivation to pursue a career in international education. Mm -hmm. So I was born in Vietnam the year the Vietnam War ended and I grew up in um, a small town in the 17 parallel which divided the country into two parts. So part of my extended family joins the South Vietnam during the war and the other part belonged to Northern Vietnam. And my parents were separated until the year the war ended. And I was educated in the post-war context. And um, there has been a constant struggle to negotiate the post-colonial and colonization legacies and anti-colonization 
imperialism, isolation, and integration. So I have been living in the family and going through education with that constant navigation of conflicting ideas and different ideology and different belief. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that has sparked in me the interest in knowing how the world outside looks like, how the world outside the small town I grew up and outside Vietnam, as well as how people not only lead through differences, but learn from the <laughs> encounter of differences mm -hmm. and how they harmonize conflicts. And um, yeah, that's motivated me to become an international student and international education has given me the opportunity to engage in that conversation and learn from the interaction of different ideas, transnational flows of knowledge and culture and skills. And um, yeah, that's how I end up working in international education. I love it. I mean, you're, you're such an outspoken advocate for international students. Um, how has it been working with them during a pandemic? I mean, it's been, you know, such a schism for so many people. Um, how did you help them navigate that? Yes, yeah, so during the pandemic, it's really a heartbreaking, but also inspiring time yeah. to work with international students and to work in the field of international education. So we have seen um, the vulnerabilities and um, the challenges that international, edu international students have gone through during the pandemic, not only um, in terms of how the transition into online and hybrid learning affect their study, and their sense of belonging and their well-being, but also the financial difficulties mm -hmm. that they have been facing, and um, the isolation and the sense of uncertainty and fears of, um, you know, in the early stage of the pandemic, whether you should stay in the host country or come back to yeah. your home country. And, um, you know, when coming back for, um, quite some time how you can get back in order to continue your study. But I think most importantly is to see um, to what extent they have been supported um, through different federal and, and state governments and different level of the local governments, mm. but also how they exercise their agency in order to support themselves and offer support for their international student peers. But and um, the diaspora community have reached out in order to provide support for international students. So um, there's a lot of struggle, but also there's a lot of uh, hope and um, commitment that I have seen during the pandemic time. Yeah, I think in, in, great tri in great times of sort of trials, we seem to see people dig a little deeper and find resilience and creativity where they, they didn't expect to find it. So. Thank you so much. So moving on to you, um, Leah. So tell us a little bit about Liminal, or a lot about Liminal, <laughs> up to you. <laughs> uh, we'd love to hear lots about it. Um, you know, on, on your website, it's, des it's described as being an actively anti-racist literary platform. What does that mean? <laughs> um, I was actually just thinking now, I kind of started Liminal back in late 2016, 2017 because I wanted to hear stories like those by Lee and Daisy, and it's just such a joy to, it's just such a, it's a joy to be here, I guess, because it's like, oh, we finally, we're getting there. <laughs> um, so Liminal came out of this desire um, to hear and talk with more Asian Australians, um, specifically creatives. Um, we've had a few, Nonce, a waitlister, wow. <laughs> which was thrilling. <laughs> um, but just lot, it's a, essentially an online platform for long form conversations with Asian Australians about their practice, sometimes about their identity. Um, it's grown since then. It's become much bigger. It's a literary magazine which publishes uh, publishes art, writing, um, comics, um, we've run a few prizes, as you mentioned, um, and it's always with this desire to kind of 
uh, act as a minor intervention in what, to create a kind of a world which I would like to live in, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I think it's just this beautiful, big, sprawling project. And I'm joined with so many incredible um, Asian Australian editors. Um, and artists who, I, yeah, I feel so strange to receiving this award because I work with the most incredible community mm. of, and team of people and I think these things are never really done alone. No, look, they, they never really are, but at the same time, um, if there was ever a time to uh, accept a little bit of personal, <laughs> you know, kind of congratulations, <laughs> I think uh, <laughs> now might be the evening. Um, but, like, I, I, you know, that's, it's funny speaking about it because it is, um, we were talking about it earlier, it's a bit of a cultural thing, you know, sort of accepting accolades and standing up in front of people and being congratulated is... I don't find it deeply, you know, a, a comfortable experience. And you know, how do, how do you find it? I think it's interesting because I think we're raised to be um, like humility is a desirable trait, particularly. I mean, I'm Indian Indian women are expected to be really humble, and you know, even like to, I've been told not to laugh too loud, not to talk too loud, mm -hmm. just to, to kind of be invisible. So I think from that angle, it's interesting how you balance kind of being like, oh, I'm honoured to receive this award. That's really really heavy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or, or it like, really oh. is. <laughs> yeah, so I, I've tried to practice just being like, oh, thank you. Um, yeah. The other day someone said congrats on something you did. I said, yeah, I'm giving it a crack. <laughs> like, I, just, I was like, I, I, it, it's a, you know, getting an award is really nice, but I think just humility in general, I mean, I tell people not to be super humble. I'm like, just appreciate what you yeah. get. I feel like Americans do this really well. Yeah. Um, they just, you know, th even if they don't have an award, they feel like they're on top of the moon. You turned up, yes. Yeah, well <laughs> done. You're going to make a difference. You're changing the world. <laughs> um, whereas here we're, we're kind of like, oh, who, who do I think I am? Yeah, yeah. So and, it's, and it's a very yeah. Australian, you know, cultural thing as well. Like you said, giving it a crack. And it's yeah. like finding ways of deflecting, being able to accept um, a compliment or, you know, a congratulations on something that's extremely clearly hardly yeah. hard earned um, is, is an interesting kind of investigation of our cultural identity. Mm. Mm. Um, you know, can we talk a little bit about, you know, we, we talked about sort of, um, Lee, some of your work during the pandemic, but in terms of the way the pandemic um, sort of inspired or affected you, I mean, obviously you started what you're doing, yeah. um, but in, on a personal note, um, in observations of your own friends and family and community, mm. um, how, how has the pandemic affected, you know, you being South Asian? Yeah. I think the, yeah, definitely the international student community. I was in touch with a lot. Actually, last year during the pandemic, I set up a house in Belgrade for women uh, going, mostly who had either been through domestic violence or were going through it. Mm -hmm. And we had about 25 women stay with us. I remember I just, I went, I stayed there and then it all happened organically. A girl found me on Facebook and said, I'm going through this with my husband. He's hitting me one. I said, oh, well, do you want to come stay here? And she did. And then another one and another one. And then um, it was, we could have four people at a time because I took over the lease over the all three, the cottage. And then I called it Soul House. I'm like, it needs a name. <laughs> the long name, the, the, the name you put for like government is Australian South, was it South Asian Women's Wellness Space? <laughs> but the nickname was Soul, Soul House. <laughs> um, and w I lived there for eight, eight months last year. So that was just in response to the domestic violence during, co uh, during COVID in South Asian communities, especially, was just horrible. I mean, mm. you've got alcoholism, you've got bottle shops open, and you've got people who. I know many people personally who um, they go to university just to kind of get out of home or they go to work just to get out mm -hmm. of home and they're trying to balance this life of, you know, still remaining in that home but going somewhere to get away every day. Yeah. And uh, I think COVID shut all that down. And although we knew that, hey, if you're in DV, you can get out, uh, they're, they're never going to call. The type of women that came had never called a hotline, had never called a support service. Even when I told them to, it was just, you know, they still wanted to maintain a relationship with their families. It's just yeah. the way it is for them. Yeah. So, yeah, that was kind of most of my lockdown. <laughs> yeah. um, Leah, what about you? What about sort of the kind of work you were receiving and publishing during that time? Um, I think... I mean, on a personal note, uh, it's been really harrowing to watch the rise of anti-Asian racism. Um, again, it's kind of touching that violence, those odd, unexpected violences that arose from COVID. When you think about it, I think of it often as like quite a static experience. And then these, you know, jabs, like I could be going for a walk and someone would yell something racist at me 
And I'm just, I'm just there in my, my fun little leggings. <laughs> I'm like, like think, what? Listening to Taylor Swift. Oh. Very, just like, I don't, I'll go home, I guess. Yeah. Um, so it was quite... You're like, yes, my yeah. home is around the block. It really was. I was like, <laughs> did I forget something? <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was an interesting one where everyone, obviously COVID and the pandemic has impacted everyone in so many very wild, diff wild ways, but it has been quite awful to watch this rise of hatred mm. and directed directly at um, Asian Australians. Yeah. Oh. And Lee, how have you found, you know, for, for students that stayed, that chose to stay here, um, how has that experience been for them, do you think, in terms of experiencing the pandemic? Yes, I, I think um, to add to what um, Dina said, for, for students to, to stay here and um, for international students in, in general, I think the pandemic exposed that there has been a lack of understanding in the wider Australian community about the contribution and the values of international students mm -hmm. and international education. And um, so we have seen a lot of um, head headlines and, and discussion about um, the loss of financial revenues and shifting market shares or oh. um, um, diversification of international student market. Mm. Um, so that add to the stereotype and, and miss about international student in a way that international student seem to be measured and evaluated in financial sense. Mm. And that overshadows the enormous contribution of international student to Australian education, to our university, school, and the vast sector, to our culture, to our society, to our diplomacy yeah. Yeah. and economy. Yeah. And I think it's the pandemic is the time for us to be reminded of mm -hmm. the significant contribution of international students beyond the academic um, economic terms. And in a lot of um, commentaries that we um, we wrote, um, for instance, for SBS or the Australian or the conversation, we receive a lot of comments and responses from the broader communities that show a sense of anxiety about international students like taking away jobs mm. um, and have a negative impact on accommodation, migration, and also financial recession caused by the pandemic. Mm. Instead of the role of international students in creating jobs and lifting up the standard, the, the living standards and the welfare of Australians are often ignored. So part, part of our job is um, to communicate the evidence from our research findings in a very simple language mm -hmm. so that it can help to enhance public understanding mm -hmm. and the broader community about the value of international students. Mm -hmm. I, I read an article in the conversation that you wrote that was just fantastic on international students and like the human rights crisis here, right here in our backyard. Because mm -hmm. some of these international students were reaching out to us who, you know, their smaller colleges were saying to them, hey, you got to pay up or you, you, you need to go back home. And so I actually ended up giving a loan to one international student for a bit because they just, they had no, you know, most of them were working pre lockdown. And then post that. So I, I yeah. really appreciate you adding yeah. the human angle back on it. I think whenever yeah. we look at people just through an economic lens, yeah. we lack that compassion and heart. And it's just, it's sad if, if you could just imagine being that person. Person, that's who's struggling to make ends meet, but media talks yeah. to you as if, you know, oh, great, Melbourne's economy is not doing well. Yeah. Yeah. You were right. asked, what is the second biggest service export or something? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's why in, in that particular article, we reminded the community that mm -hmm. international students are not just they're students. Humans. Yep. Yeah. They're, they're humans, community. but they're also part of the essential workforce, yeah. especially in the IKEA sector and the retail sector yeah. in the early stage of the pandemic, Absolutely. Uh, who have to protect the Australian communities. Yeah. So yeah. they pay fees, they pay tax, they support um, related services, including retail accommodation, tourism. But when we are in crisis like bushfire and the pandemic, 
international students play a key role in working in those sectors. Absolutely. And, and to the extent that the federal government has extended their working hour in order to allow them to work more than 20 hours per yeah. week wow. and um, yeah, to serve the Australian community. Yeah. And this needs to be widely acknowledged yeah. in order to um, evaluate um, many myths and stereotypes as much as possible. Yeah. I mean, I think it's very important bringing it back down to seeing people for being people, you know, rather than, you know, yes. representing, you know, bodies of economic contribution and things like that. So let's bring it back down to these three individuals here um, and let's talk about the women behind the multi-award winning <laughs> achievements and, you know, and... And let's talk about how you grew up because I, these are the, the, my favourite stories. Like why I love being um, a journalist is to find those little nuggets of, yeah. of joy that connect us through the way that we grew up, the shared upbringing, but also the, the things that make you unique. Daisy, would you like to start? Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I'm from a small town in New South Wales called, called Griffith. New South Wales, I don't know if anyone's heard of it. Um, <laughs> so I was like, woo, yeah, represent, the grass, represent. <laughs> the grass grows greener there. Um, it's, yeah, so I was born, like, and I was a, the fattest baby in the hospital. I was 12 pounds, <laughs> whopper. Whoa. Five kilos, yeah. I, was, I had the record for a bit there. I actually inquired recently someone's taken over. Damn. But uh, <laughs> um, So I lived there for the first 16 years of my life, and then I moved to Melbourne, so it's been a decade since I've been here. But one of the things I guess I want to share for me, um, language, like, I wasn't allowed to speak English at home. I had to speak Punjabi. Mm. Even though my mom speaks perfectly fine English, she's a teacher. Mm. So every time I asked for something, me and my brother were playing video games or something and said, hey, mom, we're hungry. She just would just go mute, like she couldn't hear us. Like she just, you know, she doesn't know we're talking. And then she would, until we say, mama, pana book lagia, meaning we're hungry. She'd go, okay, well, Gijay, okay, what would you like? <laughs> and I remember being so, I was so stubborn. Like I was, I was like, oh, why did you come here if you don't want to speak English? Wonder where I learned that from. <laughs> um, and, you know, we had this back and forth and it wasn't until like maybe 15, 16 onwards that I began to really appreciate being able to speak Punjabi, mm. my mother tongue, um, because I could communicate with my grandparents, unlike my cousins in the UK. And I could have this stronger bond every time I go back to Punjab. I just like, and they didn't just teach me Punjabi. They taught me like a villager Punjabi. <laughs> so when I go back to Punjab and I talk, people often are like confused, like where is she? She from why yeah. is she speaking like she's straight out of a village and I'm like I am it's in New South Wales yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah so language meant that I could connect with people yeah. and ever since then like I, I I mean I learned fluent Spanish for a while like I love learning languages to connect with people mm. when I lived in Thailand I took up Thai classes I never got good at that but we gave it a crack and then in <laughs> Tanzania I took up Swahili classes which wow. I did I did get quite quite decent at yeah. um, but I just think languages are a way to get to meet people and for me travel and connection is all about people for some people it's about landscape and things like that I get tired of seeing lots of different mountains I want to meet different people and learn their histories and cultures yeah. and things like that favorite yeah. food your mother cooked when you were growing up What's the dish? There's know, always a dish. Yeah, I don't, know, I don't know what it's called, but um, I was telling you this earlier. Uh, she, she makes this sabji with um, like matra mushroom and ricotta, like ricotta cheese instead of paneer. Uh, so matra is like peas, uh, mushrooms and ricotta. Yeah. And she just, it's just, ta it's really tasty. I was telling you earlier, I'm, I'm like an aspiring vegan, but not quite there yet. So, because <laughs> I still really like that. Yeah. yeah. Look, dairy's okay. It's all right. It's all right. A little bit. I mean, I feel sorry for the cows, yeah. but it's okay. It's tasty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about you, Lee? What was it like growing up for you? Yeah, so... Um, yeah, I, I, um, I, I mean, you, meant, you mentioned a little bit before, obviously, and that's like, there's a, I guess, comes into a conversation I wanted to have a little bit later of, you know, we carry a lot of intergenerational trauma through our parents and through the experiences that they've gone through. Um, but, yeah, just, can, would you mind sort of, yeah, t talking to us about... Sure. Were you a happy kid? <laughs> were you a... Naughty kid. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of both. <laughs> yeah, I, I um yeah, I, I grew up in um Quang Tri, which if you, you are familiar with the Vietnam War you will know it is the, the province that where there is the seventeen parallel. Mm. Um, we divided the country into the two parts and there is the demilitarized zone during the Vietnam War. 
and um, there is a very big gap between me and my sister and brother because my father went to the south while my mom stayed in the northern border of the 17 parallel mm -hmm. and they haven't matched they didn't meet each other until the war ended um, in April 1975 and I was born the end of that year wow. and um, my mom was 40, 45 when she got, gave birth to me and, and my father retired at that time. The war ended, so yeah. all the men have nothing to do, they have to retire. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I own a lot to the ending of the war and the reunification of the country. Had the war ended one year later, I might not come into being yeah. at all because my mom was 45 at that time, yeah. but they were so happy seeing yeah. each other and that's why they, they had me. <laughs> yeah. and, um, you were yeah. born from joy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so okay. the result of the, um, the war ending, but it also means that there's a big gap in the family and big, big generation gap between me and my brother. My brother was at university um, when I was born and the family still have the fond memory of the letter that uh, my father wrote to my brother informing that, oh, you just have a, a new baby oh. sister, so please <laughs> ask for Lee and come back home to see your sister. Oh, <laughs> so the yes. family still kept that letter and we, we talk about it. It's time we, we met each other. But being born in that generation also means um, there's a lot of war tie stories. And um, we when we went to school, Back in Vietnam, we was only the first generation that learned with new books. You know, like they talk about education reform, and we are the generation for testing of education reform from preschool to university. So always new books, um, new thing where teachers and earth learn at the same time how to explore the new cur curricul curriculum under the communist regime. Yeah. And um, also, I remember in our class of 50 students, all of us have names that are tied to the war. For instance, Liberation Nguyen, or uh, Victory Lee, or <laughs> Big Trần. Yep. And um, my sister name is Tâm, and my brother name is An. So An means Big and calm, being calm and being peaceful. And Tâm means your heart. So that combine the name, it means the aspiration for peace in your heart. That's mm -hmm. happened during the time that my parents were se separated, so they have that aspiration. But one of the names that has been extremely meaningful for me is my close friend, um, my he. So my means tomorrow and he means hope, so hope for tomorrow. So when wow. her mom yeah. was pregnant to her, her father was shot up. Um, missing in action yeah. so they named the um, my friend at hope for tomorrow meaning hopefully tomorrow the father will come back wow. and one year you know when she turned one father yeah. came back and wow the war ended. so it's amazing so a lot of things that um happened around my life is about war conflict and you know negotiation of different ideas and different ideologies you know yeah. the communist ideologies and those who returned from the north and yeah. the south yeah and I mean, the way that that's impacted on your choice in career and, and being sort of someone who bridges the gap between, you know, cultures and, and advocating for people that are less understood or really, really need to be spoken for, you know, you can sort of see where that stems from in you, which is incredible. And Leah. That's a really that. tough act to follow. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not after you. <laughs> it's not my child. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. That was yeah. really beautiful. Um, I was just thinking about how I might not exist if um, World War II hadn't stopped. My um, my family is Chinese American uh, near San Francisco, and my grandfather flew planes for America in World War II, and his plane got shot down, and he was captured by the Nazis. Um, one of his really funny story about 
trying to go to the bathroom as a Chinese man was very funny because they still had segregation and there were toilets for whites and toilets for blacks and he was like, what do I do? <laughs> um, what unless... did he do? Do I, dare I ask what did I he do? I can get him on the phone. <laughs> he would probably You need to you. text me later. I need to, I need to know the end of um, I mean, it speaks a lot to racial division yeah. and a strangeness of being uh, Asian in America, I think. Um, a sadder story is he, he fights for America, comes back after months and months as a prisoner of war, and he tries to get a job. Mm. And he's told, you know, in the 50s, um, that he's not American enough. Um, and I, that strikes, strikes me every time when we talk about these containers of Asian and Australian. And something similar to what you were saying is like, we have these strange notions of what it is to be something, and there are all these strange narratives which we kind of uh, situ are situated in and are taught and are made curriculum even. Um, and yeah, so nothing about my childhood. <laughs> Can I actually share something that you just, that reminded me when you're talking is like, I interviewed someone recently and it was after Remembrance Day, because mm. it just recently happened, and over a million Indian soldiers fought in that war that barely mm. get recognised, not a single Remembrance Day ceremony growing up in Australia did I see a, an Indian person. Mm. But her, um, her partner's grandfather fought, and then when he came back, they said to him, he couldn't get a job. And until he had a, he had a turban because they they were Sikh and they said you know you, well, you need to get rid of your turban you need to chop your hair off mm -hmm. and he's like well that's a big symbol in Sikhism you can't really do that and he's like well look if I was good enough to fight for you with my turban on I should be good enough to work for you with mm -hmm. my turban on right hundred percent quite powerful yeah mm -hmm. I mean look speaking of um, I wrote a, a an op ed in Stella recently about sort of my grief over letting go of some parts of my cultural heritage mm -hmm. in order to, you know, find um, acceptance here in Australia. Um, and, you know, speaking of, of things like that, do you, what sort of tangible memories do you have, if any, of what it was like growing up here? And do you feel like you lost anything in your, um, in yeah. your connection? I think I tried to blend in a lot for a very, very long time. I mean, countryside towns are, by my experience, brutal. I hope they're not still like that. So I, I think I copped a lot of racism, but I learned kind of how to adapt and it was quite overt. It wasn't like, yeah. So I, I had a lot of that, but I also had really good times. I mean, sometimes the people being racist were my friends and, you know, um, so it was, it was, it was kind of, I, it was interesting because you had a generation of Italians that moved to Griffith and then you had um, Indians that came there after, originally the Australian Australians. And when I talked to my boss, I used to sell I used to sell cherries outside of Bunnings for a guy called Giuseppe <laughs> every summer <laughs> from the ages of like 14 to I think 17-ish. Um, I'd even come back from Melbourne back to, to do that job. I quite enjoyed it, um, the, simp the simpler things in life. But I remember asking him, he's like, oh, you know, when we came here, we got mocked um, by the Aussies for having salami and being called wogs. And Basically all the good things. Things, yeah, in food, that we all love yeah. now, that we all yeah. celebrate on places like MasterChef. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and, and it was so interesting. There's this weird cycle of like, okay, so uh, the Italian people and Italian friends, they copped a lot of racism, their grandparents level did, but their grandchildren are being racist to us Indians. And it was this like mm. perpetual cycle of like trying to seek status and demeaning others. Yeah. And I always used to think a lot, as I think I still think a lot, of why people are the way that they are mm. and why do they do the things that they do. Mm. But I think I lost... Um, I mean, when I was younger, I didn't want to be Indian. So I'm, I'm only learning about our history and my great-grandfather now. Uh, my grandparents even all passed away when I was, like, probably in my early teens. So I didn't get to learn a lot. So I had no idea up until recently that, like, 1.5 1 million odd Indian soldiers fought in, in the army and mm -hmm. that my great-grandfather was one of those. And yeah. it's because of the work he did that we got to migrate here because he's the one who kind of farmed this jungle land in Yupi, mostly with his hands, without machinery, wow. to then like sell or to harvest that, to make the money that's come down generations to, to be able to get us here. Mm -hmm. um, but I never asked these questions. And for some reason, my, my parents didn't really tell me any of this. And even when I did try to ask, they're like, oh, you know, these are old things. Who cares? We came here to build a new life. So there's there a is, huge... There is mm. a lot of that. I can definitely identify with that as even down to... You know, my parents would only choose like new houses to live in yeah. because they didn't want to be reminded of anything old. This was a fresh start for them and new opportunities. Did this, you? Mm, yeah. This focus on success was the main thing. I think when we lost this uh, respect for heritage and culture mm. and language and mm. history is probably what I lost up until I'm reclaiming it now. Yeah. But I had no curiosity growing up on that.
Yeah. Um, let's switch it up and talk about um, the future of your respective industries and what you envisage, you know, now that we're in this sort of post, hopefully post-COVID, well, I don't, don't, don't mention it. Um, <laughs> Lee, the future of um, international students, you know, what can we expect in terms of, you know, the industry's return and, and the return of international students to, to Australia and how will they adjust to this new world? That's a very big question. <laughs> just, just to try to talk about the future then. <laughs> um, I think there would be a range of factors that we need to consider in order to rebuild a sustainable and, and effective international education sector. But for me, perhaps the two things that really stand out and really critical are a reciprocal and coordinated international education sector. I think it's really crucial that we pay attention to the term reciprocal in international education in two ways. First is being reciprocal in learning mm -hmm. from our international students. And that will allow us the, the opportunity to be engaged in learning from the encounter of differences and maximize the opportunity to learn reciprocally and uh, learn from intercultural interaction mm. and mutual understandings. And um, I, I think let's look at international education in a reciprocal way. So we often talk about international students and their role and their contribution to the Australian community, but we shouldn't forget that Asian countries and the Indo-Pacific countries also present at transformative education destination for our Australian students. Yeah. So prior to the pandemic, um, around 49% of Australian students who learn abroad learn in the Indo-Pacific. Mm. But I think that is little known within the broader Australian community. Right. Um, and in our research program, we collect evidence of impacts about how Indo-Pacific destinations have posit positively influenced Australian domestic student professional development, academic learning, but also human-to-human -human experiences, human-to-human -human connection, and human-to-human -human empathy. Yeah. Now, that is a wonderful that. Um, we have the opportunity to sponsor Australian students to the Indo-Pacific country to learn, but we shouldn't waste the opportunity to learn from international students who 100%. are here in Australia, yeah. and around 80% of them are from Asia. Yeah. Um, so what I mean by the first part of reciprocal. The second part of reciprocal is that we should accord more attention to building a more reciprocal responsibility international education sector that show our responsibility in looking after and caring for international students in their time of need in particular, yeah. but also when things are back to normal during yeah. their, their face-to-face learning, online and hybrid learning, and not just learning, but also their well-being, their mental health, their employment and future aspiration. So I think it's really critical. And um, the second thing is a more coordinated international education sector in the sense that there should be more effective coordination across different levels of the government, including local, state, and federal government in policy, in the protection of international students and their human rights, but also the better coordination across different departments of the government, including migration, education, home affairs, and tourism, for instance, and also better coordination among different organizations within the communities who are caring for international education and international um, student in Thank particular. Um, last question, and 
I'll let anybody field this one. Why do you think that it's important to acknowledge the achievements of Asian Australians? Do you want to give it a crack? Why, why it, not? Please <laughs> <laughs> go. I said, did you want to? Go on. <laughs> you just threw it back. Right? About 30 <laughs> seconds. Um, <laughs> I, look, I, like you said, you can't be something you can't see. And I, I think it's really important. One of my role models, Layla Jana, always said, uh, talent is, is equally distributed, but opportunity is not. So across the world, there are people who are enormously talented here. There are people who are enormously talented. But opportunity, I think, goes a bit different to how, you know, we want to think we've got a merit to, I can never say this word, meritocracy. Um, <laughs> how do you pronounce that word? Meritocracy. meritocracy. Meritocracy, that's it. And I think people are always like, oh, we have a meritocracy. But I'm like, if you look at the way opportunities go and um, if you look at, you know, the institutions out of which uh, produce our leaders and whatnot mm. and how access to those institutions and how you get there and then you start to, to realise it's not really the way we'd like it to be. So I think it's really important to celebrate, um, I guess, Asian Australian leaders because then other people can be inspired and realise, oh, if they got there, maybe I can get there too. Yeah. And I think we've, in Australia, we've come a long way. Like in, I mean, if I think about it, in, in, in Victoria, there was roughly 700,000, I think, or was it, I think roughly, Victoria, Australia, 700,000 Indian Australians. Mm. And I rarely ever see um, Indian people in the room at certain functions I go to or on leadership boards mm. or things like it's that. about visibility. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm. Okay, well, thank you so much. So, um, wherever you have joined us from this evening, hello out there. Um, thank you so much for being part of this very special event. Um, now I'd like to invite Carol Orlin, uh, CEO of the Wheeler Centre, to the stage to officially close this evening. very lucky to be uh, one of the one of the uh, sound check people um, I was very lucky to be one of the judges um, I'd like to say thank you to the Asia Society for bringing us this amazing opportunity and partnering with us at the Wheeler Center um, this is such important work as I was saying the judges we had a wonderful time uh, looking through so many so many shortlisted uh, you know potential winners and you all looked very, very impressive on the page. But you have just blown my mind <laughs> tonight. Um, we're so privileged to have you. We are so privileged for the work that you do. We're so lucky for the work you do. And um, congratulations. Melissa, thank you for being the most amazing host. <laughs> um, Philip and the Asia Society team, thank you again. Uh, your uh, Russian... Um, <laughs> Russian Daniel Andrews was very good. Um, how wonderful to have um, the Premier of New, S of New South Wales. <laughs> I'm a Sydney person. Um, of Victoria supporting these, um, this amazing initiative, but also the Lord Mayor. I think that that holds these awards in great stead and I'm sure we'll be back here again next year with another round of winners. Um, how wonderful to see three, four amazing women on the stage. Um, thank you all for being here. It's beautiful to welcome you back in person to the Wheeler Centre. And um, I hope you'll join us again. And thank you to everybody.